This video is all about the chicken, a descendant of the dinosaurs that now provides humans with nutritious eggs and meat. We'll discuss the personality of the chicken, the historical relationship between chickens and humans, and how scientific developments in the 20th century led to a distinct form of production where we have some breeds of chickens that are raised for eggs exclusively and other breeds that are raised for meat exclusively. First, let me introduce you to my three chickens, chickens I raised for eggs. I've learned a lot about these birds in my backyard, and they're truly interesting. At first light in the morning, they're ready to exit the coop and eat. What do they eat? Well, they're omnivores, so they love a wide variety of food. Seeds, of course, like cracked corn and other grains, any rather small seed, but they also eat grass and other plants. Their favorite food by far, though, is insects, and they will come running for insect treats, but they especially love catching live insects. They'll even eat frogs, small snakes, and mice. If you drop an egg and it cracks, they'll devour it, but they will never crack an egg themselves to eat it. They'll even eat each other. Once I was in the yard and my leg was bleeding and they started pecking at my wound. Now this didn't surprise me because I knew if a chicken is bleeding, other chickens will often attack it, kill it, and eat it. Their digestive tract is interesting. They have a crop in their throat where they store food. Food from the crop later travels to the stomach, which we call a gizzard. We don't call it a stomach because it doesn't work like our stomachs. Instead of using chemicals like acids and enzymes to break down foods, their gizzard uses frictions. Chickens consume small pebbles that rest in their gizzard, and then their gizzard grinds the food in the same way we would mill wheat to make flour. The gizzard is much like a blender, grinding the food down to a powder that can be easily digested. People like me who raise chickens in their backyards always make what we call grit, which are just small pebbles, available to birds, just in case they can't find enough small pebbles outside. At some point during the day, usually in the morning, they'll lay an egg, and during the summer, they'll lay an egg almost every day. And when they do lay an egg, they often sing a special song, what I call an egg song. It sounds something like this. <laughs> The chickens like being around people and dogs, not just because I feed them, but because they know they are safer from predators if I or the dogs are in the backyard with them. They'll actually spend much of their day staring through the window at me inside the house. They spend a lot of the time of the day grooming their feathers. This involves removing feather mites, straightening their feathers out, and taking oils produced on a gland near their tail and spreading it all along the feathers for shine and waterproofing. The act of spreading the oils all about the feathers to make a clean and shiny uh, look is called preening. And they love to dust bathe. This is where they find a dry patch of sand and they spread the sand all up around their feathers. This is partly to kill parasites living in the feathers, but I think the main reason is the, the sand soaks up the old oil, older oil that was on their feathers, oil that needs removing to be replaced with new oil. In the evening when it becomes dusk, they'll return to their coop on their own. And when they were young, they would sleep lying in a nest, but once they're old enough to lay eggs, about four months, they prefer to sleep standing on a perch. My birds get along well with each other because the flock size of just three is small. Chickens will quickly develop a pecking order where they know who the dominant birds are and who the subordinate birds are. And once this pecking order is established, there's no fighting because fighting is usually performed for the sole purpose of establishing the pecking order. That is, unless they see an open wound on another bird that activates something instinctual and causes them to attack the bird. Chickens usually remember the pecking order in a flock of up to 90 birds, but when the flock size exceeds that number, they have trouble remembering who is dominant to whom, and so they fight more often to keep reestablishing that order. This isn't a huge deal if the birds have plenty of room to escape an aggressive bird, but large flocks in confined spaces usually result in considerable aggression between birds. That's why larger flocks in cramped quarters tend to have more fights, more injuries, and higher mortality rates. 
Chickens have pretty good eyesight, hearing and sense of smell. They even respond to odors and chirp to one another while they're still inside the egg. The chicken was originally domesticated from four types of jungle fowl located around South Asia and around 6000 BCE. There's the red jungle fowl of South Asia, the gray jungle fowl of India, the Sion jungle fowl of Sri Lanka, and the dr green jungle fowl from Indonesia. Though they served mainly as a source of food, they play a starring role in human culture as well. We've been fighting roosters, known as cockfighting, for over 2,000 years. Chickens appear in all sorts of ancient pottery, and they're in the cast of characters of many religious stories, mainly due to the rooster's penchant for crowing at first light. In traditional Korean weddings, a hen and rooster are placed on the wedding table to mark a new beginning, like a new day. Christians may remember the story of how Jesus told St. Peter that before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. So in the ninth century AD, every church in Christendom was required to carry a symbol of the rooster on its steeple to remind them of the movement. And that's what began the tradition of having a rooster on a weather vane. There's some evidence that domesticated chickens reached the Americas on the boats of Polynesian explorers more than a century before Columbus came to the New World. However, for the most part, Native Americans had no domesticated fowl other than turkeys, though there were wild prairie chickens in North America. Chickens were very important to the early, early European settlers in the New World because they could, the chickens could acquire their, new food, their own food and they could provide large amount of nutrients through their meat and eggs. Often the chickens did not even need a coop for their home. Remember how I said my birds prefer to sleep on a perch? That's because if they don't get accustomed to using a coop, they'll naturally fly up into the trees to sleep or some other high place like the roof of a house. This video is mostly about chickens, but I should say a few words about turkeys. Native Americans had domesticated turkeys before the Europeans arrived. The reason English speakers call them turkeys is that when the turkeys first arrived in England, they reminded the English of the guinea fowl bird, which was introduced to the English by Turkish traders. So the English called them turkey cocks or turkey hens and eventually just turkey. Back to chickens in early America. A German traveler to Pennsylvania in 1750 remarked, hogs and poultry, especially turkeys, are raised by almost everybody. In this country, the chickens are not put in houses by night, nor are they looked after, but they sit summer and winter upon the trees near the houses. Every evening, many a tree is so full of chickens that the boughs bend beneath them. The poultry is in no danger from beast to prey, because every plantation owner has a big dog, if not more than one big dog, at, uh, around his house. Now I want to talk about the chicken industry as it existed about a century ago, before factory farming became a thing. Farms back then were nothing like today. In 1920, the average farm size might be about 150 acres, and around 30% of the U.S. workforce was in agriculture or farming, and today that number is only about 2%. Rather than specializing in one or two commodities like farms do today, each farm produced many different goods. Most farms would grow grains like wheat and corn and have multiple livestock species, namely cattle, hogs, and chickens. Until about a century ago, every farm would have chickens, and the birds were prized mostly for their eggs. Eggs are highly nutritious and easily storable and easily transportable. We think of eggs today as perishable because when we buy them at the grocery store in the U.S., they are refrigerated and must stay refrigerated. That's only because today's egg producers wash the eggs, and the washing procedure removes the natural outer layer of the egg called the cuticle. And the cuticle keeps bacteria from getting inside the egg. With the cuticle gone, bacteria can easily contaminate the inside of eggshells in the U.S., so refrigeration is unnecessary. 
Now, I don't wash the eggs from my chickens at home. And so those eggs still have the cuticle to protect it. So I can leave them at room temperature and they'll stay good for a month. I never refrigerated my eggs, the eggs my hens lay at home. And many places in Europe don't remove the cuticle either. And so their grocery stores will sell the eggs on unrefrigerated shelves. Eggs were a boon to our ancestors as their, their hens would produce about an egg every day and it could be stored for weeks. Chicken meat, on the other hand, is highly perishable, more perishable than pork or beef due to chicken's low saturated fat content. So in the days before refrigeration, when a chicken was slaughtered, it had to be consumed immediately. Each farm would usually have their own roosters and hens and do their own breeding. The male babies, referred to as cockerels, can be used for meat consumption. Once the cockerel was old enough to breed, it was saved for, if it was saved for breeding, then it becomes a rooster. And by the way, there is such a thing as a castrated male chicken. They're referred to as capons. And in France and East Italy, they're often eaten at Christmas. Capons are easier to raise than roosters and allow you to acquire a bigger bird while still having high quality meat. Back to the cockerels. These cockerels at slaughter were small, only about two pounds when slaughtered. Today, they're about four to seven pounds when slaughtered. These chickens were so small that they could be cooked by broiling, and thus they become, became known as broilers. That's why today, chickens raised exclusively for meat are referred to as broilers. Because these broilers were so small and didn't grow as fast as they do today, they were fairly expensive. Today, chick chicken meat is the cheapest form of meat, but it wasn't always the case. A typical broiler might cost about $8 a pound or more in today's dollars in the past and compare that to about $1.50 a pound today. Back then, chicken was more expensive than beef. As such, chicken meat was not eaten on a regular basis. And so in 1928, when the Republican Party promised they would put a chicken in every pot if elected, they were promising prosperity. While the cockerels were reserved for meat consumption, the female babies, referred to as pullets, were raised for egg production. Once the pullets begin laying eggs, they're referred to as hens. After about two years, the hens become unproductive egg layers, and they were then slaughtered and used as stewing hens. Their bodies put most of their effort into producing eggs, so they don't have much meat, and the meat they do have is tough. However, they have lots of fat that makes a delicious broth for soups, and that's why they were called stewing hens. So that describes chicken farming as it existed about a century ago. Today, most farms produce only one or two commodities. They're much larger, and they better resemble a factory. Most all chickens today are owned by only a few corporations, and if you actually raise chickens today, you probably don't even own the feed or the chicken, and the corporation tells you exactly how the bird should be raised. If you're involved in egg production, you're most likely not even an independent farmer, but the employee of a corporation. Moreover, while a century ago, the same type of birds were used to produce both meat and eggs, and farmers sold both meat and eggs, today the industry for, there's a, one industry for meat, and then there's another industry for eggs, and they're two completely different industries using different breeds of birds. Most all chickens and eggs today are produced in what we call factory farms. Now the term factory farm is often used today as an insult, but this wasn't the case in the past. At the beginning of the 20th century, there became something that I call a cult of efficiency, where that it began taking hold where efficiency here means using fossil fuels, factories, and scientific management to produce more goods using less inputs. People at the time praised the efficiency of the factory because they witnessed how that efficiency improved living standards. Consider this, if you lived in say 1910, you might marvel at how much wealthier the world was then compared to the past. Think about it. Up until 1800 AD, the average person's standard of living was only slightly higher than it was in the year of 1 AD. 
Then, between 1800 and 1900, the average person's wealth in the world doubled. Where did this wealth come from? Largely the Industrial Revolution, where Europeans and Americans began working in factories, factories using machines and fossil fuels, factories where managers not only supervised labor, but used principles of scientific management to get more production out of every hour of labor. And it worked. Far more goods were produced and it increased the wealth of everyone. Before 1800 AD, about 94% of the world of humans lived in extreme poverty. But by 1920, that number had fallen to 82%. By the way, that number fell to 55% in 1980 and is only 9% today. If the factory gave us better clothes and better transportation, why couldn't it give us better chicken meat and eggs? That was the thought and well it worked. Starting in the 1930s, the government began investing money into researching better ways to raise chickens. And they learned that if you keep hens confined in a cage inside a building with only four to six hens per cage, where the temperature and the light could be better controlled, the birds lived longer, were healthier, and produced more eggs than, say, free range hens. Confined production was made possible by the discovery of vitamin D in 1919. Feed manufacturers soon learned how to add vitamin D to chicken feed and that negated the bird's need for real sunlight to make their own vitamin D. Whereas the chicken farm in 1840 had chickens running around in open air, the chicken farm in 1940 began to look more like a factory. But the real boom came with the chicken of tomorrow contest in the 1940s. Here, the Great Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company, a chain of retail grocery stores referred to as A&P, worked with the USDA and land-grant university universities to sponsor the contest. Chicken breeders entering the contest would submit 720 eggs from their farm, and the contest would then raise the birds under identical conditions and track their progress. After 12 weeks, the birds were slaughtered and judged according to the quality of their meat and how quickly they grew. This contest was first held at the state and regional level, but then it went to the national level and eventually two national champions were crowned. Arbor Acres Farm in Connecticut, who sent eggs from the white Plymouth Rock breed, they were the national champion in terms of meat quality. The Vantress Hatchery won the contest for feed efficiency with its cross of red Cornish chickens crossed with New Hampshire reds. And then people eventually learned that crossing white Cornish roosters with white Plymouth Rock hens resulted in superior birds in terms of both the chicken meat production and its quality. We refer to this as the Cornish cross. The Cornish father's genetics led to high growth rates and feed efficiency, whereas the white Plymouth Rock's genetics led to high quality meat and good reproductive traits, like a uh, high rate of egg production. The white feathers from the rooster and hen are valuable too. We prefer broilers with white feathers because when slaughtered, the small parts of the feathers remaining after defeathering are harder to see if the feathers are white. But if you defeather a brown feathered bird, you can often still see the dark roots of the feathers. And though there's nothing wrong with that, consumers don't like the appearance as much. Around the same time, people were also learning that chickens in the leghorn family of breeds were especially good at laying eggs. Better knowledge of how to breed birds for eggs versus meat then allowed chicken farms to specialize. So today, most farms use producing chicken meat raise only broilers using the Cornish cross, and most farms raising eggs produce only eggs using a leghorn cross. today's broiler industry. Let's take a closer look at the breeding programs used to produce the chickens you eat, the broiler. That chicken you eat had a father. Let's first look at how that father was created. You start with an elite group of pure line white Cornish birds. What's a pure line? A pure line refers to a group of birds that have specific and known genetics. And when you breed these birds, they pass those genetics down to their children. 
Conversely, a cross is when you breed a rooster and a hen from two different pure lines. If you cross certain pure lines, they often have gen a genetic profile superior to their mother and father. However, they don't necessarily pass those genetics down to their offspring. These pure lines are very valuable. They're cared for under maximum security farms where it's very difficult for a pathogen to get in and even more difficult for someone to steal one. Let's first talk about how we get the father of the chicken you eat. It starts with a pure line of white Cornish roosters and hens. Not just any pure line, but a group proven to produce roosters that yield superior offspring. Those pure line birds are used to breed the great grandparents of that rooster. You breed them to get the grandparents and you breed them to obtain the rooster, the rooster that is the father of the chicken you eat. This is still a white Cornish bird. The genetics of that rooster is created in that pure line and the purpose of the generations between the pure line and the rooster is just to replicate those genetics over and over until we have enough roosters to father the eight billion broilers that we eat in the U.S. each year. Now for how we create the mother of the bird you eat. Whereas the father of the bird you eat is a pure line, the mother is actually a cross of two different pure lines. It just happens that this is the best way to get the ideal mother. Like before, we start with the pure line birds, but here we have two different pure lines. One pure line will definitely be of the white Plymouth rock breed, as that is the breed that produces the best mothers and that they have superior genetics for reproduction. The other pure line may be a different group of white Plymouth rock birds, or it may be a different type of Plymouth bird. Frankly, much of this is kept a secret because of the high value of those pure line genetics. The broiler breeding programs are kept mostly secret for the same reason that the formula for Coca-Cola is kept secret. It's too valuable to share. Back to the different pure line breeds. For now, they're kept separate. Each pure line is bred to produce great-grandparents and grandparents. You then have four pairs of grandparents of two different pure lines. Those pure lines are then crossed to create a crossed hen. That hen is then the mother of the bird you eat. There isn't any intuitive reason why the mother, but not the father of the bird you eat is a cross. That's just how the genetics work out. All of the genetics we need are created at the pure line level. And then again, the purpose of the other stages is just to replicate those genetics and then combine them towards the end. For every bird at the pure line level, we get only about nine offspring, offspring for the great grandparent level. That's because the pure line birds are less productive and we're more selective about which offspring we reserve for breeding. For every bird at the great-grandparent level, we get about 35 grandparents. For every grandparent bird, we get about 35 parents. And then for every parent, we get about 130 offspring that will be eaten. At the parent level, the birds are more productive, reproductively, and we keep every bird we can, and that's why you get so many offspring for each bird at the parent level. To recap, we eat about 8 billion birds in the U.S. each year. To get those 8 billion broilers, we start with only about 5,500 pure line birds. We breed them to get about 55,000 great-grandparents of the birds, and we breed those 55,000 great-grandparents to get 1.8 million grandparents. And then we breed the grandparents to get 62 million parents, and then we breed those parents, 62 million parents to get the 8 billion birds we eat. Each stage takes about a year, so this is a four-year process, beginning with pure line birds to get the broilers you eat. This means that the chickens you eat today are made based on breeding decisions four years ago. Now you might be wondering, how are they bred? Are they using artificial insemination or natural mating? At the pure line and great-grandparent stage, it's mostly artificial insemination, but at the grandparent and parent stage, it's natural mating. The bird that you eat then is usually a three-way cross, the progeny of a pure line rooster and a two-way cross hen. This leads to the absolute best broiler in terms of carcass quality and feeder sufficiency. You may ask then, if those broilers have the best genetics, why not breed them? because they won't necessarily pass those specific genetics onto their children. 
Consider the impact these genetics have had on broilers. In 1940, it took about four kilograms of feed to obtain one pound of chicken meat. Then we found better and better genetics for reducing the amount of feed needed to acquire one kilogram of meat. In 1991, that feed conversion was only two kilograms of feed and is now 1.63 kilograms of feed. Because of this, compared to broilers in 1940, broilers today produce twice the amount of meat for the same amount of food, are twice as large when harvested, and reach their harvest date a whole 64 days earlier. And it's been estimated that about 85% of this improvement in feed conversion is due to better genetics. The other 15% is due to better feed, better health care, protection from predators, and the like. A quick aside, while I'm concentrating mostly on genetics here, the housing systems we use to raise birds have changed a lot also. And this has reduced the mortality rate of chickens considerably. In 1940, the mortality rate was about 10%, meaning for every 100 birds, 10 would die before slaughter. Today, the mortality rate is only about 3%. This reduction in mortality is due mostly to changes in how we raise broilers. This is because the birds are kept indoors, protected from predators and bad weather, and due to improvement in disease management. Now back to the genetics of broilers. So think about how valuable those pure line birds are. It's their genetics that are responsible for the birds we eat, and there's not many of them. So there's a trade-off to relying on a small flock of birds for genetics. On the one hand, just a tiny improvement in genetics at the pure line level can deliver an enormous amount of value in terms of higher profits for companies, lower prices for consumers, and less intensive resource use. On the other hand, if you make a bad decision at the pure line level, the cost of that bad decision is also enormous. Consider that in 2021, Tyson Foods announced the small shortage in the amount of broilers it could produce simply because some of their pure line roosters were not as sexually prolific as they thought they would be. Overall though, it seems worth it to base the broiler industry on the genetics of the few best birds. China right now is desperate to obtain some of these pure lines because the breed of birds they have are genetically inferior and they'd rather not have to rely on American corporations for their broiler chicks. Now, there is a cost to those genetic improvements that lead to faster growing birds. One is that the parents of the broilers are fed a restrictive diet, meaning they don't get to eat as much as they would like to. For example, the breed of birds might receive only 35% of the feed they'd like to eat, and that's not good for animal welfare. Also, the broilers grow so fast that they can experience health problems, like leg problems. In response, some people think we should be deliberately raising slower growing birds to ensure adequate animal welfare, and there are broiler breeds that grow slower. The problem is that this can increase the cost of raising chickens by about 70%, and most people just aren't willing to pay those higher prices when they can get the faster growing Cornish crosses for cheaper. In this video, we've covered the long history of our relationship with chickens, especially in regards to our chicken breeding programs. So let's look back on just how much chicken consumption has changed due to its now lower cost. This graph shows the amount of beef, pork, and chicken consumed in the last 100 years in terms of pounds eaten per person. Beef, pork, and chicken consumption per person is shown and the y-axis. Uh, pork consumption per person you can see hasn't changed much and beef consumption did rise in the 60s and 70s but it hasn't been falling since the 1980s. But consider the pounds of chicken eaten per person. It was only about 15 pounds per person in 1909 but it's almost 100 pounds per person today. That's an enormous increase. And notice when it started to rise in the 1940s after the chicken of tomorrow contest. 
chicken consumption rose because the genetic improvements made it so much cheaper and made the meat better and with a more consistent carcass and more white meat, which is what Americans prefer. Consider that in 1935, the price of retail chicken was about 30 cents per pound. Now, in today's dollars, 2021 dollars, where we correct for inflation, that's about $8.50 per pound. But today, chicken costs only about $1.50 per pound. Another way of seeing this is to note that the average wage in 1935 was around uh, 45 cents per hour. So in 1935, working one hour brought you about 45 cents per hour divided by 30 cents per pound of chicken gives you 1.5 pounds of chicken meat. Today, the average uh, hourly wage is about $30 per hour, which today buys you, take $30 per hour, divide it by $1.5 per pound of chicken, 20 pounds of chicken meat. That difference is mind-boggling, and it's mostly due to improvements in genetics, an improvement brought about by the public and private sector working together to improve the lives of Americans. Ha, 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 ha.